Awesome. So thank you everyone again for joining us today. And our last class of today is Mission Mars 2020, talking about the Perseverance rover led by our Washington Wing Director of Aerospace Education, Major Kazmarsik. So without any further introductions, I will go ahead and turn it over to Major Kazmarsik for her class. Hello, can you all hear me? Is everything okay? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. I might have to do that a couple of times when I switch back and forth between the computers and I apologize in advance for that. Um, so thank you for joining us today. And um, as you can see here on my display, these are the type of material that you will need for the class today. So I hope you're ready to have some fun. Uh, but we do have also some um, general information and theory part that is going to be shared with everyone. Um, we're going to talk about Mars today, but we're going to talk even more specifically to areology. Areology is the, the study of Mars, but if you want the geology of Mars, I have a hard time saying geology because geo means Earth. So geology should be, it is actually the study of Earth, so we should not say the geology of Mars, we should say areology, that is the study of Mars. But by default, we kind of extend that, um, that name and we say the geology of Mars is the study of the, the ground and the inner part of the planet in itself, like we did for the Earth. We're transposing our knowledge of the Earth onto what we're observing on Mars and trying to understand Mars. And from that, we're learning information that will help us understand better what's happened on the earth in the past and also what can happen in the future. So um, if you have any questions, please um, uh, put them in the chat or you can also unmute yourself and, um, and call from our attention. Uh, when I share screen, I don't really see the chat. Um, I don't know if somebody can uh, keep an eye on it. I don't, I see Lydia Colonel Wallace. Would you mind helping me with that? Keeping an eye on the chat, sir. I can't hear you. You're muted, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hey, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep an eye on, uh, on the chats then. Okay, perfect. So if you see something that needs to be addressed right away, please interrupt me. Otherwise, um, when we reach a, a stopping point, um, you can call back on, on that question that will help me as I can't see everything with you two computer and the demonstration table. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate your help. Sure. So um, thank you. So um, before starting any training, I do a quick safety briefing. We have the typical safety briefing, which is stay hydrated, have um, a beverage, preferentially water beside you. Um, if uh, you're working with electronic, so there's going to be cables, please be careful, don't trip on them. If there's, you want to keep your fingers away from any plugs, any live wires, or you want to keep the fluid away also from the electronic as that can be dangerous and risk of electrocution in addition to tripping. And the other thing is I want to make sure everybody has a wing person, somebody at home, a backup person in case of emergency. If you do not, please let us know in the chat so that uh, we'll check on you um, as needed to make sure you're okay if we don't see you in the video. Um, for the other thing, you do have a variety of materials. It does include some glass. Be careful not to break anything. Uh, glass cuts and hurt. And we do have um, consumable materials, like eatable material, uh, in front of us. We're going to avoid eating it during the activities. We'll keep that once the activities are finished, as you might run out of um, material if you eat it all before we finish with them. So and that's about it. If you have any question, um, please um, submit that in the chat. Other than that, I am going to be um, putting my slides on. I'm gonna share my screen. If you let me. Oh. 
Okay, so you can all see the, the slides. Um, hold just a second, I need to adjust on the other side. There's one thing I really dislike about Zoom is that every time your presenter modify their screen or share their screen, it messes up your configuration. It's very annoying. But um, as you see on these slides, I, um, we are in the AE classroom right now. And uh, we are going to be, my, my cursor doesn't want to work. I'm having so many technical problems today. This is not funny. I click and it doesn't want to work. And uh, so I apologize for that in advance. Well, hang, hang in there. We, uh, we just lost your, uh, your shared screen though. I think that that was uh, something that you <laughs> needed. There we go. Oh, here I am. That's it. Okay, so it's back. So we're talking about Mars, the journey to Mars. So there's a lot of background studies. We've been working and studying Mars for decades, for centuries, actually, because people were already looking at it with telescopes. And we were learning from that and accumulating more and more information. First from the Earth, then after we got even more information when we use satellite, especially um, satellite telescopes that allow us to have a better view of the planet. Then we also started sending probes. So we have a variety of probes that got sent and we have a lot of orbiters around um, Mars. And we also have landers and um, we have rovers on Mars. So actually, I was pretty impressed by the, the Mars Exploration Family portrait. I didn't realize there was that many. Um, and, and it just keep accumulating. And you'll notice when you look at the dates that actually sometimes there's a specific year, like right now, 2020, we had more than one mission that left for Mars. Then we wait a couple of years, then there's more mission living. And there's a reason for that. And um, I'm wondering if the cadets will know why is it that we can't go to Mars every year whenever we feel like. You can unmute yourself to talk. Because it would be too costly. Okay, that could be costly, but there's a reason why it would be costly. But if money was not the problem. Well, time is also a problem. Time, okay. <laughs> Come on, get it. Try it, why is it? Think about it, why? The planet's not livable yet. I'm sorry, could you repeat? The planet isn't livable yet. Okay, that's another option. What else? Think about it. So we're going to continue a little bit more than we're going to see. There's a reason if there's some um, adult senior members that will know why is it we can't, we don't go to Mars whenever we feel like that we choose specific windows of time to go to Mars. Any senior member will know? Uh, yeah, Major uh, Kamarsik, uh, the Lieutenant Girl Wallace again. Uh, it has to do with orbital mechanics because where the planet Mars is outside of our orbit. Our planets only align about every tw uh, 26 months or so. And uh, there's only about a one, one month uh, window to be able to get uh, the travel time down to something that would be under a year. Uh, you, can, you can have a, uh, if they're in the worst case, uh, it would take over two years to get to the to planet. Exactly. We have to see the orbit of Earth around the Sun and the orbit of Mars around the Sun. And we are not orbiting 
um, in a way that we could neighbor to each other all the time. There are times we're totally the opposite of the side of the sun, or at that time we're really close to each other. And so we choose every 26 months or so when the Earth and Mars are getting the closest to each other, this is when this is the optimal time to go because we can travel there in a shorter time, a shorter distance, and that's going to make it much, much cheaper and much more feasible because you will need less fuel to go there. So that's exactly the reason. So from there, when we look at so over the years, we've learned a lot about Mars. Um, certain things we've learned before we were able to get closer to Mars, such as a year on Mars is 687 days. That's a lot. Um, well, for us, it's 365. Uh, how much is a Martian day? It's actually really close. It's just a little bit more than an Earth day. So one soul, when we're talking soul. So if you go to the NASA website and look at the missions, the different missions on Mars, they will give you the timing of the mission in souls because they're talking in Martian days. Um, in the bottom left, they show you um, here that you have the 26 months. So look at the orbit of Earth and the orbit of Mars. And they, because they also orbit at different time, you have to see Earth does one turn in 365 days, while Mars does that in almost about two years. You have to see that Earth turned twice during that time. So there are times when Mars might be here and Earth is on the other side. So you have to kind of um, think about you know, the, the position. We learn about the weather on Mars, the temperatures on Mars, um, and realize that they are really freezing temperatures. But depending on the day, you know, you can have a 70 degrees Celsius, uh, I mean Fahrenheit, 20 degrees Celsius, um, day, depending on the season, the exposure, the distance from the sun, the tilting of the axis of Mars and a variety of things like that. The winds, the winds can get pretty, pretty strong. We're talking about 144 kilometer per hour. So it's a little bit less than 100 miles per hour because 100 will be 160 kilometers. And then we learn about the, Mar the topography, the shape of Mars also. So we learn already a lot. And here there's a variety of interesting things that we've learned about it, about the density. Because, and all these things are things we need to think about. If we want to go and have a human settlement over there, we have to think about gravity. It's kind of nice, you know, that I'm not going to weigh as much, you know. I want to lose weight. Well, just go on Mars and you lose weight, you know. <laughs> You're about, you know, 40% of your regular weight. But... I mean, not 40%, 60%, a little bit more. Anyway, so um, you have to think about what's the composition of the atmosphere, what's the temperature, what's the pressure, what's the gravity. We've learned from having astronauts and spationauts and cosmonauts, depending on where they come from, being on the ISS and spending so much time up there that it has an impact on the body, the changes in gravity. And so we have to take that into account. The, the atmosphere, you know, the composition of the atmosphere, can they survive on Mars right now? No, there's no oxygen. There's no free oxygen on Mars. And we need our oxygen. It's, we can't survive there as it is. There's many other reasons why we can't. Also, it's freezing cold, depending where you are. So, And we won't survive. Even the electronic dies if it's in the freezing cold. Um, but there's also um, other things, such as radiations. And we're going to talk a little bit about it. So. We know it has two moons. And so there's a variety of things that we have on there. Um, so if you're curious, NASA has such a great website. If you put NASA, Mars, and you'll have so many uh, web pages and resources. There's so much you get swamped in it and you don't know what to do anymore. 
But one of the greatest things we've done, we've gotten from having all these orbiters is having these beautiful pictures of Mars. These photos were taken and then sent back to Earth. And from there, we learn about how Mars really looks like and, and its shape and also its chemistry. So we've learned a lot. So here we're going to look more at the geology. And just looking at it, I can see I have some more brown area. I have some more dark area. And I have some white areas. And if I say white, what does that make you think about? What do you think is happening? So here, the big rectangular a picture is like a map of the world, but instead of being a map of the Earth world, it's a map of the Martian world. And the two circular pictures on the right, uh, at the top, it's the North Pole picture, a view from the top of Mars. And the bottom right is the South Pole view of Mars. So if I see white, what do you think about? If you have a picture of Earth like that and you see white, what do you think about? Yes, yes, snow, ice. Not exactly snow because snow implies something else, but ice, we have solid water. Well, white, is it only pure water or is there something else? Because we know that the atmosphere on Mars is very rich in carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide does get solid and looks like white ice also when it's solid. So there's some things that we sometimes we're like, oh, is it water or is it carbon dioxide? Well, guess what? We have these school orbiters that have these special uh, spectrometers, readers, these special cameras that, that can actually have some um, reading that allows them to identify the chemistry of things. It's not very detailed, but it still gives you a hint about what it is. And their hint is we do have water on, on Mars, but it's solid water. That's a big issue. And um, right now at the surface outside of that, Mars look like a very desertic land. It looked kind of all brown. So I cannot say a lunar landscape because the moon is more gray. Here it's red. What will make it look like red? What do you have on Earth that looks red like that? If you go anywhere outside and you see some red, or if you look at thing, metal thing that becomes red with time, what do you think it is? The adult can jump in if they want. Oh, yes. I don't know who is Camp Butcher number three, but good job. Iron oxide. Exactly. That's part of what is giving the color of the ground is the fact that the minerals are rich in iron and they, if you have iron oxide and hydroxide, different variety of minerals that will give this rusty or terracotta color and that's due to the iron. So great. So you actually, see, you know a lot already. Then I have this dark and lighter. I, if I look at the top and the bottom, like North Pole, South Pole, I, you know, I see that the North Pole has a lot more ice than the South Pole. So there's already certain studies that can be done from that. But just with the color, it's kind of hard to, to know too much because a lot of it look kind of, kind of flatty. I see a lot of polka dotted thing. What do you think of all these polka dots on the surface of Mars? All these little marks that are roundish. Yes. What type of craters? Because, you know, there are many different types of crater. I have volcanic craters. I can have sinkhole looking craters. I can have meteorite craters or impact craters. I can have, you know, 
explosion, phreatic explosion, um, cryogenic uh, eruptions. What type of craters most of them are? We're gonna have a bunch of meteors or meteorites once they land, meteors when they're up in the, in the air. So that's part of what we see from there. Then, I don't know if you see the alignment here by my cursor. I don't know if you can see the cursor. There are three big dots. They look like pimples. And there, so it's on the left side, you have three big dots aligned in oh, one line. Do you see part. it? These are like really big. So it's like these are big pi um, pimple looking things. We're going to yeah, look at that. Uh, and uh, upper left to uh, it, uh, you're going to uh, have uh, another uh, one. Um, another, but it's much larger. We're going to go back to these guys. So there's a lot to, to see. So what i am gotten after that, I've gotten a picture that showed me the topography. So for those who did topography with us, the topography means that we're looking at the shape of the land. So the lower it is, the more blue to purple to almost black. So you have black, purple, blue. So that go from the deepest to shallower. Um, then it goes green, then it goes yellow, then orange and red, then brown to white when it's the highest. So remember the three dots that we looked at earlier and the funky, or the slightly larger dot on the left of the map that I called pimples earlier. They look even more like pimples now because they white on the red background. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but these are really, really tall. What can be that shape and really tall like that? What do you think these are? Yes, they're mountains. And more specifically, when you have an isolated mountain like that, that is conic and that goes so high that with steep mountain, I mean, steep slope like that. What do you think that could be? A an isolated, yes, a volcano. These are volcanoes. And they're not puny volcanoes, they're gigantic volcanoes because we see them from space. And these volcanoes are actually billions of years old. We don't even think about it. We think about the volcanoes on our planet and they erode, they disappear. That's because the surface of the earth is always changing. We have lots of alteration and erosion, weathering is happening and, and transforming. Mars doesn't have that. There's no water on Mars anymore. There's wind. And the wind can erode too, but it takes a lot, a lot longer to do that. So we can see things are billions of years old on Mars. Then remember the polka dot things I was talking about? Look how many more pucks do I have? And you can see that some pucks are overlaying over each other. And some pucks have, like if you go to, at the bottom right, you have this big, purple area. Then if you go just straight up from here, you have like rings. Can you see? You have one, two rings. You have rings in it. So this is actually a special crater. And if you go up in the northern part, you see even more where you see either you have um, a little bump in the middle or you have rings in the middle. So these craters with these shapes actually gives us information about the impacts. Are any of them Olympus Mounds? Very good question. It is, one of them is Olympus Mounds. Can you guess which one is Olympus Mounds?
the biggest one, yes. The one is at the northwest of it is Olympus Mount. It is the largest. And we're going to talk more about it in just a little bit. So if you go now and you have the, the two pictures on the side, you see that the north pole vision, the north polar vision shows a lot of blues and a little bit of green. Well, the South Pole vision show you red and orange and even pink and yellows and maybe a little bit, tiny bit of green. So what does that tell you? If you look at topography, what does that tell you? Which one is higher, which one is lower in altitude, in elevation? I have very shy cadets today. <laughs> the senior members are welcome to join in if they want to. So pretty much what that tells me, looking at the topography scale, that tell me that the north part, the northern hemisphere of Mars is actually more made of lower lands. That's what that tells me. Well, the southern part, the southern hemisphere of Mars is actually made of highlands. So that's a big difference. And you can see how there's very few pokes on the northern side where there's a lot of pokes on the southern side. And that allows us, that gives us ideas about how old they are because to have so many crater impacts and have so many large crater impact, that means that these highlands are actually ancient. They're billions and billions of years old. While the Northern hemisphere might have had some earlier uh, land forming, but a lot of what we see now in the blue, there's a few pocket that is actually much younger. So just by looking at that, we can have an idea of what is younger, what is older. And that tells us that the lands, the continents, if you want, are mostly on the southern side of Mars, while the lowlands are on the northern side. If there was water on Mars right now, the water, the ocean, will be mostly on the northern hemisphere, and the lands, the continents, will be mostly on the southern hemisphere. That's how that will be. So if we were to throw water on Mars, that's what will happen right now. Um, but you have to think it's like, well, maybe all the meteorite fell on the southern side now. Mars was bombarded right, left, all over the place with the same frequency all over. So that's not the reason. It's just because that land wasn't there to keep track of the, the record of the meteorites at that time. So when we think about the, um, the, um, the ages, actually the meteorite, I would like to do the first experiment actually. So here we see, we have um, on the upper left, you can see that depending on the diameter, we noticed different part in the atomy of a crater, whether we have just a pit, a simple crater, if we're going to have a complex because we have a little dome in the middle, if we're going to have a ring. Remember how we saw ring in some of them and some have multiple rings. We even have some craters on Mars where they're overlapping. So there's three here. There's a triple crater complex. And um, here there's two. So um, this kind of give us some information about the planet. And we're going to talk about this one after. So first, let's look at these three. Did they arrive at the same time, these three meteors or asteroid, whatever, the three meteorites that fell? Did they fall all three at the same time? You can vote yes or no on the if you open the chat of the participant, you can vote yes or no. What do you think? Is 
Did it happen all at the same time? I have one no, one yes. Two no. Three no. Four no's. Keep going. We have many more participants. Well, the answer is no. And how do I know that? Is because of how it formed. I love the capital no for from Cadet Cleave. No, no, they didn't form at the same time. And one of the reasons I know that is because if you look at them, you can see that the uh, the they're overlaying and destroying what was before. It's erasing the prior morphology. So which one do you think was the very first one to form? The one on the left, the one in the middle, or the one on the right? We're still on these three here. Is it the first? This is the first or this one is the first? Which one is the first? Left, middle, or right crater? And you notice how it gets smaller as we go. Left. This is correct. The first one was left. And you can see because the crater number two is overlying on top of it. Then you have crater number three is the last one because it's erasing part of crater number two and part of crater number three. This is actually a point, a big um, feature that we talk about in geology when we're trying to date things relatively. We look at cross cutting. So for Crater number three to erase crater number two, it has to happen after because I can't erase something that is not there yet. So, and if you look at crater number two in the middle, you can see it, it's erasing crater number one. So one is older than two, but it is being erased, it's being cross cut by crater number three. So that's the cross cutting principle that we use in geology. And you can see at the bottom right picture how we have these craters, the one at the bottom, we have one on the left and one on the right. Which one arrived first, the left or the right was first? Look at the features on the picture. Which one was first, left or right? So we have one right, two right, one left, two left. Oh, where are we equal? Okay, Lydia Colonel Wallace, what do you think? Which one is older? I have to say that I have to pull the ch the, the the chat uh, the chat uh, line goes goes over the photograph, so I can't can't really see. Oh. We're looking at the photograph oh. in the top left hand or top right hand corner. Yes. Uh, no, bottom right, bottom right. Bottom so right. if if your chat is overlying, if you go in the upper left of your screen, you have a little icon that say view. If you click on it and you see a escape full screen. Yeah, I can, the, I can I can do that on my laptop or my computer, but I can't do that on my iPad. So, but that's uh, okay. but that's okay. I can see it now. I would say definitely the one on the left. Yes, because of the way the the crater on the right um, has superimposed over it is the is the later the later one. So the earlier one would have been on the left, and the later one on the right. This is correct, exactly. So you have the little crater with the dome here on the right is erasing part of the structure of the crater on the left. So the crater on the left is older than the crater on the right. So that's for our special stratigraphy lesson in relative dating. And, uh, and we don't date relative, that's different. Relative dating as opposed to absolute dating. Absolute dating, I need to have the chemical composition uh, and look at the radioactive isotopes that will tell me the exact date. Otherwise, I have a range of data. I can see which one is older, which one is younger, but that's it. I chose the picture of the crater on the left because I was like so amazed that look at the ice. 
there's a glacier, there's ice all year around in that crater at the North Pole of Mars. This is just impressive. We, we've learned so much since we've had all these orbiters going around and taking all these cool pictures of Mars. And if we have ice, that means we have water. Yes, it's solid water, but we know how to melt solid water. The thing is, it's very limited quantity. But there's other thing, have you heard in the news, they started with Perseverance, they started to create oxygen. They actually took the carbon dioxide and, they, and broke it down to be able to release oxygen. So they can do certain things. You know, technology is evolving and we're working towards not just learning, but also modifying where um, we are in Mars. So we're going to do a little activity. So I'm going to stop my sharing. If I can find my, my sharing spot, thank you. Um, I want to stop share. Okay, so now I'm going to pin my screen over here. I'm spotlighting for everyone. Can you all see my table with all my goodies? Yes. Perfect. So now, if you want to have some of that, you'll have to come and get it. <laughs> <laughs> and I live by uh, uh, close to Everett, South Everett. So um, I'm taking out the mess. And we're going to do a quick little experiment to look at craters. And some of you might have done that in the past, and that's totally fine. But some of you have not had a chance to do that. So I took a plate. I say a flat plate because sometimes you have the balls and I, I, I like a flat one for that activity. Then uh, what you're going to do to do our craters, you do need um, some regolith. So what is the regolith? Is the surface of Mars, a little bit like um, on the moon, is actually partially covered of hard rock and partially covered of these um, sand and debris, you know, where there's gravel mixed up with it. It's loose sediment compared to when you say rock, it's a consolidated sediment. So, and actually, as you can see, they kind of look like Mars, doesn't it? So you're all doing that at the same time, okay? And what you're gonna choose now, you're gonna choose objects. So I am going to take, let's see. I'm going to take um, two objects of different size. I have here a gumball. It's a fireball. I don't know how that tastes. I don't eat these things. And this one will be contaminated with gingerbread cookies thing. Then the other one is, because it looks very rocky, and it's called a, a rocher. And rocher in French is a rock. So I thought I'd play with my jelly. So I have two objects. And what you're gonna do, you're gonna experiment making craters. So you're gonna have to take your notebook on the side and from there, you are going to take notes as you can. For example, I can drop my rocher, just vertical. Then I take it out and then I see my crater. You might want to put more um, material if you want. And then I'll do it with a gumball. Oops, I moved it. So if I looked at the size of the crater, the rocher was large while the gumball was smaller. And when I take the measurements, I will see that some of this crater is about four and a half centimeters, while this crater is more like two and a half centimeter. So the size of the meteorite is going to impact the size of your crater. What is my regolith made of? My regolith is made of crushed cookies. I have two types of cookies. I have um, the light color and the dark color, and I chose the dark color cookie that I crushed prior to class as the instructions were saying. So 
you can try to throw it from higher lower you can try to throw at an angle and if i see at an angle i see a trace what about this guy oh look at that you can see a trace of it so all that is going to impact so i'm going to give you about let's say five minutes where you're going to experiment with your you can take you know if you don't have gumball and rocher you could have a walnut you could have an m m this is like a peanut m m so you can go different angles different height so you're going to experiment with making craters and what you just have to do uh, after you're thrown you have to kind of reset your um your regolith so that you can observe your next one and you're supposed to take notes you're supposed to have a, a ruler so you can measure and you can draw the shape of your um your crater in your notebook so it's uh 244 i'm giving you until 250 so 1450 to work on that to throw candy in your crushed cookies and draw the craters and measure them and right beside how you got you know what's different from one to the other i drew from uh four inches high i i dropped it from eight inches high i throw it at an angle i throw it down straight so you're gonna look you're gonna write down also what you did i throw a little one or a medium or a big one so go ahead so this is your time
Okay. So did you notice any differences depending on the size of your meteorite? If your meteorite gets bigger, does your crater stay the same size or does it get smaller or does it get larger? Hello. <laughs> Is anybody doing the experiment at the same time? So here, here at WAMA at Camp Boucher, we are trying it. We have three different teams doing this and yes. we are finding that the larger one made bigger deeper. Yes, they're measuring some and how they, um, from what distance are dropping them. Yes, exactly, exactly. So the larger the meteorite, the larger the crater. Then after, if I throw it from higher, do I have the same crater or is it smaller or larger? I think it gets larger, ma'am. It gets larger, yes. The higher, the larger. And now, um, when I do at an angle, do I have a nice circular shape crater? No, ma'am, it gets a little bit messy. It gets messier, it gets elongated. <laughs> That's why I have a tray over my table to kind of collect the crumbs, but I still have to vacuum after, I think. <laughs> or the dogs will help me. <laughs> but totally, so you have to think about that when you have an, a, a crater impacting a surface. This is going to impact the result of what you're gonna do. I love what Major Crozier is doing now. He has his powder on the paper, then he's dropping little things on it. Perfect. Yes, you can do that outside. You can do it anywhere you can. Uh, sadly, I'm doing that in my little office corner. <laughs> so I don't have a lot of room because I need the, the, the camera for the computer. But yeah, so it, it is, you know, experiment with that. And if you go outside, um, find, for example, a playground. Find a playground that has a sandbox and try to smooth a little bit the sandbox. Then you're going to go with different type of balls. You can go with a soccer ball. You can go with um, a baseball, a golf ball, a ping pong ball. Make sure the sand is dry because if it's wet, it doesn't work as well. And the sad thing, most of these balls are light, so they don't work uh, as well. You ate all your regolith already? Oh, no. <laughs> You're not supposed to eat it until we're done, but that's OK. Still someone else's. Then um, the other thing is uh, what I've used in the past is uh, if you play bachi. If you play bachi, there's like these bigger wooden balls. And in South France, we have uh, pétanque ou les boules. And they're smaller and they're still balls. So you can also, or you can use rocks, just rocks. Yeah, no, I agree. Crushed cookies, I still taste like cookies. They're good. <laughs> but so you can use rocks. You have to make sure there's nobody in front of you. So you want to have all your your friends um, and partners in this experiment, they're all behind you and that the sand is in front of you and you will throw, you will drop 
while you're in front of you and you'll take turns, but you don't want anybody in the front. I'll suggest um, having a yardstick and measuring the heights at which you, you're gonna drop your rock or big ball. If you, uh, then after you can also measure the angle at which you're gonna throw it. You can measure the crater depending on how high you, you dropped it and a variety of activities like that. It's actually kind of fun to, to do that. Then after, depending on how well you did it, you'll be impressed that with the sand, because it's thicker, you can actually have a more complex crater with a dome in the middle um, if, if you're lucky, if you have a good surface. Here with the regolith in the plate, it's too shallow. We just get to the plate, sadly. But um, if you do it in the sandbox, you'll be surprised. You actually can get, you know, even the, the ripples. That, that would form. I'm gonna have to kick my dog out. So I'm gonna give you like a three minutes uh, break. I'll be back at 3 p.m. It's 2.57. That allows you to put away your material, but please do not eat it. We still need it. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's see if I can get this reversed here. There you go. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay, I lost a bunch of powder in the grass, but uh, that's okay. See. What did you use? Oh. Flour? It's just flour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, he, he missed off the center. Oh, there we go. Oh, look at that I one. Need, nice. I, I need I need to get some deeper ones or uh, more flour on there. Yeah, but look at that. <laughs> These are beautiful. Oh yeah. And you can see the overlap. And so if you had a different uh, diameter, you'd be able to see the, the you know, different di diameter of balls. You'll have different diameter of craters. And so what they saw is like for the early time on Mars, we had um, a lot more frequent impacts and they were also larger impacts. And with time, the impacts have gotten smaller and smaller. That was awesome. Thank you very much for sharing. I appreciate. Sure, you bet. Hopefully you got that one. I had a couple different yeah. sizes too. I had some fishing weights too, but I had the good ones were the little 60 caliber balls there. That was perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. Really appreciate that. That was great. Here we go. We go back on Mars. Are you all there? So how old do you think Mars is? How old do you think our planet is? Wow. Think about it. How old is Earth? How old is our solar system? A little less than that. Okay, so it's comparable. The Earth, the age of Mars will be similar to the age of Earth. And that will go with, um, oh my goodness, 50 billion? You prior to the Big Bang. The Big Bang is like 13.7 billion years. Our solar system, um, we're talking about having the the nebula and the formation but between five and six billion years and uh, the earth you're getting closer major closure 3.5 4.6 yes you're gonna treat i'll send you a treat you're the colonel treat what's your favorite treat because I'm saying I cannot find any Mars, so I can't send you any Mars. But you find the uh, the age. So exactly, regolith. <laughs> so I'm guessing you want cookies, okay? <laughs> right, you type of cookies. Um, so the Earth is 4.56 
billion years, 4.56. And so if we round the number uh, to two digit, that would be 4.6 billion years. We're gonna call it treat one. And Mars is about the same age. But when we look is that at that time, there was a lot of, well, Google need to update. It's 56. Or maybe for Mars, for Mars, 54, maybe, but Earth is 56. It's like, last time I check. <laughs> it's okay at the digit because there's always a plus or minus because of um, the technology we use for dating. So um, there was a lot at the beginning, there was lots of impacts, there was lots of material on the disk circling the solar system, uh, the, the, the solar protostar at the beginning that became the star, the sun, and all this matter were smashing into each other. Imagine kind of like a snowball. When you roll the snowball in the snow, you are picking up the snow as you go. So the planet grew the same way, that was the accretion phase, where where the protoplanet was um, um, were orbiting around the sun, and as they were turning around it, they were collecting. Yeah, no, four point six. I agree with you, sir. <laughs> um, they were collecting. They were impacted with all this material, and that's the accretion. They were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, exactly like a snowball. And that pucked, that marked the surface, but also accumulated lots of energy. So the early Mars was a boiling ball of lava, the same way Earth was. And as the they were cleaning up the orbital pathways, they got less and less um, impacts happening, and they start being able to cool down. And as they cool down, they're also degassing. And as it's degassing, we have also some volcanism happening. So we have the release of heat and release of gases. And that's how we, that we're gonna form the proto-atmosphere, the early, the primordial atmosphere. We did the same thing on Earth. They did the same on Mars, the same thing happened. And, um, that's the big, big, large crater that you see are dating from the early time over 4.5 billion years ago. And um, what we see from the, the crater, we see that the southern highlands of Mars are actually much older than the northern lowlands. They have smaller crater and less frequent. So if we look at what happened at the beginning, about 4.5 billion years ago to about 4.1 billion years ago, we're getting a lot of impacts. We have the land that is um, that is forming uh, at the bottom, the continents are starting to form. We have the crust there that is forming and we have the continents. Um, forming in the southern side, the atmosphere is going to be very dense, lots of gases coming apart from the extra Martian, not terrestrial, but extra Martian impacts, you know, all the asteroids and comets, and the degassing from the Martian mantle also. And that release a lot in the gases release, there was water vapor. And the water was released and the atmosphere was steamy at that time. And as the temperature cooled down, what is going to happen to the steam? Where's it going to go if, it's, if we're dropping the temperature? If we increase the pressure, because there's lots of pressure, it's like a pressure cooker at that time, but the temperature are dropping, what's going to happen to the gas water? Come on, get it. What happened to water, gas water, when we cool it down? Well, it, before it freezes, what happened to it? It rained, yes, yes. It's going to condense, it's going to rain. And it will freeze when it gets very cold, but we're not freezing yet at that time. It's still warm. So we actually have liquid water. We have proto-oceans. We have primordial oceans on Mars. So this is um, 
hypothesis that we have because of what we know of Earth and what we've observed on Mars. The freezing will happen much later. Um, so we do have ocean. And if we have oceans, we have, go, we're going to have that first possible emergence of life, which is about the same time that we are hypothesizing that life happened on Earth also. So they were all about the same time. When you get it to 4.1 to 3.7 billion years ago, there was still some heavy bombardment, but not as much. And But the thing is, um, there's a lot of activity in the mantle. And so we have a lot of volcanism happening. So you remember the three, um, sorry, pimples, like I call them. In the red area, you have the three dots in lines. These three volcanoes were actually formed at that time. So they are really, really old volcanoes because we're talking about, <clears throat> sorry, oops, I didn't mean to change my slide, okay. Sorry, so we're talking about 4.1 to 3.7 uh, billion years ago. So we're talking about 4. Uh, 4,100 to 3,700 million years ago. So that's a very long time. We don't have a lot of rocks that old on Earth. We have a few spots left. Most of them have disappeared because they got erased, they got eroded, or they got buried. Uh, there are new rocks, new sediments. But there on, on Mars, we still have the remnants from these ancient time. So that's when we have Escrius, uh, Pavonis, and Arcia month. And I think I might have, no, I have the picture after. So I'll show you after. So we have these thing. And the other thing that is also happening, we have a gigantic rift that is starting to happen. We have swelling of the, the red area and we have a gigantic rift. And that's Valles Marineris. It's a gigantic um, canyon that we see at the, the surface of Mars. At the same time, because we have so much volcanoes, we're gonna have a lot of ash, a lot of gases in the atmosphere. So we have a lot of greenhouse effects. It's gonna be very, very warm. The planet is gonna be very warm. We very likely have clouds. We very likely have uh, precipitation raining. So we're talking about an active time with water and because of the shape of the land, we're um, the the Mars geologists, the areologists are thinking that the ocean was very likely in the northern hemisphere. Um, even though any little puddle will form and lakes and seas wherever there were some lowlands in there. And, uh, and that created, as we look closer, there's some area close to uh, Valles Marineris here, if you go to the right, you can see that there's like some shapes that look very um, like if they were made by rivers and they show so some erosion features are typically shown by rivers. And the thing is um, also from the chemical um, the chemical analysis done by the surface rovers, they found that some of these uh, rocks were chemically altered by non-acidic groundwater, but that means by water that was not acid. One of the thing is when there's a lot of volcanic activity, there's a lot of acid in the atmosphere and we have a lot of acid rain. But depending on where it is, we don't always have acid weather because there are some spots where they found some non-acidic groundwater. And that's where we have clays mineral that are going to be forming. That very typical that these are very hydrated minerals typically. So they're going to lock some of the water. But there's a big thing that is happening during that time uh, prior to 3.7 billion years. The big thing is the planet, as we noticed, was like half the size of Earth. And the the impact is kind of slowing down. The planet is degassing. 
it's cooling down little by little. And it's as it's cooling down, things are gonna happen. So here is a, a picture comparing the size of uh, Veles Marineris compared to the size of the United States. It'll take you a while to travel that canyon. And then there's a comparison to here, the, the Grand Canyon of Colorado. It's huge, huge, huge difference. It's pretty impressive. Um, so that was Valles Marineris that is here on that side. And here are my volcanoes. So we have Escrius, Pavonis, and Arcia. And what happened in the other time, because it's uh, Mars is cooling down, we do not have the liquid parts in layer inside the the planet that will allow it to have a magnetic field. So Mars, its magnetic field is gonna weaken and weaken to the point of disappearing. And that is actually really bad because disappearing field means disappearing shield, protecting the planet from radiation and protecting its atmosphere also. So, but what happened as it's cooling down, we still have some habitable environment, but they're getting less and less, smaller and more localized. Um, and in the, where that was possible, we could still have life. So as we have the less and less uh, craters happening, uh, less impact, smaller impact, we still have volcanism. As part of this big volcanism, we're going to have lots of um, acid that are going to be like sulfuric acid that is going to be causing a lot of erosion. And um, about 2.9 billion years ago, this is about the time around that time that we're towards the end of volcanism because the planet is getting colder and colder. So we have less and less magmatic activity. And that is when Mount Olympus or Olympus mounts um, form in that time. And so look at the comparison of the size of Olympus mounts compared to Mauna Kea in Hawaii, or even compared to Mount Everest. The reason I wanted to have Mauna Kea is because Mount Everest is not a volcano. It's a collisional mountain. It's not volcanic. Well, Mauna Kea is actually a volcano. It's the largest volcano on Earth. And it's even when you look at it from its base at the bottom of the ocean, Mauna Kea is taller than Mount Everest. And Mount Olympus is twice the size. It's gigantic. Um, uh, I call it Mount Olympus. It's like the English way of saying Olympus Mounts, but it's huge. And it has a caldera that is two miles deep. Um, any of you have gone to Crater Lake in Oregon? If yes, click yes. If no, don't click it. Click no. <laughs> yes. So you've seen a caldera. The volcano of Crail Lake is Mount Mazama, and it had some catastrophic eruption. The magmatic chamber empty from different vents, and the roof of the, the magmatic chamber could not hold the weight. It collapsed, and that created the caldera. So that's what Olympus Mount has also at the top. It's not a regular crater. It's a caldera. So. Anyway, so there's a lot of really cool thing to observe there. We're not gonna make volcanoes here. If we were in person, we'll be making eruptions. We'll do that when we get back in person. Sorry about that. But um, because the atmosphere is getting thinner and thinner, so we have less magmatism, we have much weaker magnetic fields to disappearing. The atmosphere is being blasted into space. It's gonna become very, very thin. It's everything is drying. And because of that, we have a lot of aeolian, so wind type erosion and patterns forming now. And all the water that is left is gonna either evaporate into space or it's gonna freeze. But there's some that is still in the underground and probably freezing. And um, so when we look at what we have on Mars now, where is water? 
water is in the ice in the poles and some glaciers. And um, they believe that water is also underground. And they saw some, from some pictures, some seasonal changes that will show that um, there could be some water, if it's warm enough, that could uh, thaw the, the ice and, and you know, then, then from there be able to have some gullies forming and, and movement. There's also that uh, the freezing temperature of water, pure water, is might be 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but oh, for Hawaiian hotspots for Mauna Kea, correct. Um, but if you have brines, that means water rich with uh, different chemicals, different salts, it will stay liquid at lower temperature than water freezing temperature. And that will allow these brines to continue to flow even when it gets cold. And there, as they're thinking that the temperatures on Mars are changing, depending on um, on the tilts uh, and how it is located compared to the sun and all the variety of changes. There's a lot of uh, climatic change on Earth. It's not just the Earth. It's at the scale of the solar system, but even at the scale of the galaxy. Within the galaxy, there are different cycles. We have cycles in the decades. There's cycles in the centuries, in the millennia, in the 10th of thousands of years, the hundred thousands of years in the millions of years, there are different cycles that overlap over each other. And that's the same thing on Mars. And they think that Mars might be coming out of a major ice age. So we'll see if we see some flowing happening. Here I have a, a slide that show on um, upper left, the earth with the dark solid core of the earth and the yellowish orange liquid outer core. The core of the Earth is made mostly of iron, and there's also some nickel and some sulfur, some other component, but mostly the majority is iron. And when you move this iron, this rich solid with the liquid over it, you end up creating an, a magnetic field. And that is what creates the shield of the Earth, this magnetic field where we use with compass to see where it's north, where it's south. Well, and you can see that here on the right, it shows the magnetic field of the Earth. These lines are the, the field lines. And you see that they are the solar winds and the mass ejection, all the solar particles are coming towards the Earth like any other planet. But our shield, our magnetic shield, is going to protect us and filter the majority of the particulate. It's going to protect our atmosphere. It's going to protect us from radiation and a lot of the particles that comes from the sun. But if you look at Venus, that, it, it doesn't have that. Mars doesn't have it either anymore. But because now Mars, sadly, its core is solid, its mantle is not active anymore. So in the past, Mars used to have a magnetic field that put, protected it, and we had an atmosphere, so we could have life more easily. But now we have a very thin atmosphere because the shield is not there really to protect. We know that Mars had a field because we had um, we have found some remnants of the, the field in some of the rocks. So we know that there are some spots that are magnetic, that have an orientation. So the magnetic field of the Earth is very important. It's our shield. So we need our shield. And when we say it's fluctuating, it is fluctuating. It's worrisome. If it's weakening, is it weakening because it's going to reverse? Or is it weakening because it's going to stop? And it's kind of scary when you think about it, because if it stops, that's our protection. And that's why being on Mars is very dangerous. Not only you have low gravity, you don't have oxygen in a very, very thin atmosphere, but you're not protected from, radi from radiations. So where are we going to leave? Yes, the Galapagos Islands are also at a hot spot, and also Yellowstone. There's many hot spots. Yeah, and so 
And that's part of the thing to take into account when we do habitation on Mars, you know, thinking about it. So if you look at the history of water on Mars, that's what they think happened, that there were like about 4 billion years ago, there were oceans, but as the planet uh, cooled down and the uh, magnetic field weakened, the atmosphere evaporated, the water evaporated, and only a little bit is left. So. And here's a comparison of the ocean in the solar system. Earth is not the most, is not the only one with oceans. Look at Titan. Titan is 11.4 times the amount of water and 11% of it is liquid water. While Earth, only 0.02% of liquid water. So it's actually pretty impressive, but Mars used to have water. When you look at the atmosphere composition, you can see there's a lot of changes. Um, how our nitrogen and oxide is very important for us. Carbon dioxide, aside, we can have only a small quantity or it'll kill us. And um, the atmosphere on Mars is very different for that, even though we can extract oxygen, now we know that. Does that mean that, well, if it has an atmosphere, if the temperature are okay, if there's a little bit of water here or there, could we have life on Mars? Could anything that live on Earth live on Mars? If it's in a protected area, yeah. That's, when we, that's why when we do astrobiology, we look at extremophile. It will be, for example, all the studies that we do in Yellowstone, where we look at microorganisms that live in extreme situation, either very hot or very cold or very acid or very basic chemistry um, with oxygen, without oxygen. Does, do all organisms need oxygen to survive? What do you think? But carbon dioxide does have oxygen, the extremophiles, yeah. There are, um, it's not like even when we do photosynthesis, we use the light of the sun and then we use the carbon dioxide and the water to extract oxygen to make the sugars. And that's what most organisms are relying on the oxygen that was created through that branch. But there's all the chemosynthetic ones. They are organism that don't use that at all. They're gonna be, for example, working on methane. They'll be breaking apart methane, get the energy itself, the energy from the oxygen branch. They're gonna have it by breaking down uh, methane. And others will be based on other or, um, type of chemicals. So it's possible. We don't know. That's what we really want to know before we go there. And um, here, when you look at the temperatures, we do have an overlap of temperature that is present on both Mars and Earth. And if we look at the living conditions, you know, on Earth, you know, this is livable. This is getting way too hot. It's really difficult when we get close to uh, 136 degrees Fahrenheit. Thankfully, Mars 86, that's fine this summer. But when we go in freezing, this is, that's it. Like we can't go very far in the freezing. Even the electronic doesn't survive it. So we're gonna have to find a way to protect ourselves from the temperatures uh, if we go to Mars. Um, if you're still doubting whether there was water on Mars, here's a picture that show you rocks uh, from Earth and rocks from Mars. And look how similar they look. These are sediments and they actually are more like a river-like sediments on the right. Um, and on the top, it's kind of a bit more angular, so we might have some tallies. But you can see, can you see like the one they uh, circled, the, the pebble, actually it's more gravel they circle, how it's kind of rounded edges. Well, that's the thing is on Earth, if you have, if you were to take Play-Doh and make something angular, if you roll it, it'll become round, right? That's, a, that's what happened in water. As you roll the, the 
angular rocks that fell in the water, they're going to chip on the outside and they're going to become, as they're being transported, they're going to become more and more rounded. And to be rounded like that and be smoothly rounded, that's typically, especially for something that is one centimeter di um, in, um, in size, that's a water transformation. That's a water, that's the water that is transforming that rock. So there's liquid. Even if it's not water, it's a liquid. It's a liquid transportation that will do that. Um, here, they've done some studies to look at the hydrogen and see where would water be the most abundant. And right now, what we see is that water would be the most abundant at the poles, mostly. And um, the problem is that for solar panels, we need to be close to the equator to get as much sun as possible. But the water that we could use for us is mostly at the pole. So, and that's what we see here also, where you see especially the North Pole as the most hydrogen concentration that will go towards the most possible water, potential water compared to the South Pole. And when you go to, towards the equator, you have less and less. And so that means that solar panels are gonna be an issue at the pole. And uh, if you look at perseverance, you notice that we have um, away from the equator, perseverance is here, you're right here in the G0 crater area. So it's kind of halfway, but does perseverance have solar panels? Does it have only solar panels? Perseverance has a special um, radioactive power source because of where it's located, it cannot rely only on the sun. And it doesn't want to freeze either also, because if the electronic freeze at this temperature, they die totally, they get destroyed. That's what happened to some of the landers that we had, um, they froze, they were unable to, to warm up. And once they froze, we can't wake them up back from Earth. Here you have a distribution of the different land. I put um, north of Perseverance is going to be the Zurong rover from China. They're supposed to arrive sometime this month around mid-May, so probably in a, in a week or two. And here we have the Rosalind Franklin rover that is supposed to land um, they're supposed to be launched in 2022, a couple of years later. Why? Because we have to wait to about 26 months in between the launches. So if we launch 2020, we have to wait until 2022 to launch again. So I'll show you. And um, when you have polar landers like these, these are the ones that are gonna be looking for water. The, uh, that's pretty much what they're doing. Perseverance has actually, um, it's not looking just for water. Perseverance is looking at the site on was there water? Because if there was water, there's a higher probability that we had life. We want to know was there life? Is there still potentially life on Mars? And then one no know about the geology because the geology will give us information about the water and give us information about potential life forms. But also that give us information about us for later, if we want to go on Mars, we need to know what to do to be ready to go on Mars. And there's also a big deal is to create a, a benchmark to know how is Mars now? Because we keep sending things on Mars. Every time we send something on Mars, we contaminate Mars. And I did use the word contaminate. We are bringing with it our own materials. We are potentially bringing living organism. We try to sterilize everything as much as we can. So we bring as little as possible, but who knows what we missed. So there's also that is what is the impact of 
our terrestrial exploration towards Mars. What are we doing to Mars? So we need to know how is Mars now so that we can see if we have human pollution on Mars that is developing because of what we're doing. So here, so that's just another view, uh, Perseverance arrived here. So Perseverance was launched, that was a collaboration with of NASA with the United Launch Alliance. They were hired, uh, I mean, contracted to be launching Mars. Um, the three main goals of Mars, uh, Perseverance or Mars 2020 mission was seek past life, collect rock samples and prepare for human to arrive there. And we have a rover and we have Ingenuity, which is the little helicopter that is really cool, but we're not gonna talk about it today. Um, even though it's really cool, it did fly again. So when we use the candy bars, oh, we're going into that now. So that's the launcher, Atlas. Um, we see how the trajectory is that we have to calculate so that we make the trip the shortest possible. And, um, I'm hoping some of you saw the entry descent and landing with the sky crane. It was really cool. And, um, and then the rover was there. Then after it dropped Ingenuity, it was really nice how they did that because they actually had um, the computer evaluate the topography, compare it to the map it had in memory, then from there divert um, the landing site as uh, to be in the area they wanted to land. Um, so that's the part. Then the, um, the sky crane flew away to go crash somewhere else. That's just a picture of the landing. And there is your, um, it has lots of cameras. It has speakers. You can listen to Mars sounds. You can hear the wind. You can hear the electronic on it. It's really cool. If you're interested, I can send you some links. But NASA, I have access to all that, of course. And um, there's different type of camera, like ultraviolet and x-rays and different uh, cameras that have different type of lenses so that we can do close up or far away, that we can do chemical composition or a variety of things like that. So it's really, really cool, heavy duty and very expensive. I'm gonna pass that part, go, oh, okay. And where we landed is called Jezero Crater. It's one of the craters that was formed a few billion years ago and there's some smaller craters inside but the reason they chose that is because they noticed that with the shape of the land and the marks that they will say the little valleys it looked like that was uh, a watershed a watershed it will be a side of a hill where all the water that falls on that side of the hill will accumulate and go down to a main area it will go to Jezero crater then there's an outlet valley where the water will come out and here's the landing site so you can see um on the left there's the um it comes in and it goes to other circle and there's a delta a sediment delta these are very propitious environment for that you can see a close-up for a life to form but when we look at this delta you can see that it looks like it's different layers and what they thought is that billion years ago there was a lake there that's what they're thinking and that's what they're studying they're looking at the minerals they're looking at the rock they're looking at the different layers so the experiment we're going to first do is we're going to go back to our regolith then from the regolith because that shows the different layers and the different events is going to happen um it gives us an idea of what happens um and then from there we go to the candy bars so I'm going to stop the sharing there and um, let me go down to more. Stop. No, sorry, my thing is once again, I need to stop the sharing. Tim. Ah. 
It's not helping me. Come on. I'm having a, a problem here. Okay, it looks like I'm gonna have to disconnect that second computer because it's <laughs> it's it looks great. I don't know, but it's just kind of like totally messed up. So um I'm gonna go on that. I was having technical problem today. Okay, so I'm going back to here. I'm taking away my plates. Hopefully you cleaned up before. I didn't clean up my mess yet. You gotta be careful not to drop it on the ground. Then as part of what you were supposed to get, you were supposed to get um, a jar. And what we're gonna do with this jar is we are gonna look at what happened when geological formation are being formed. So for example, there's some sediment that arrives and I'm gonna put my dark color sediments and you're all doing that with me. I put about half inch of dark color sediments in it. And uh, I'm gonna put about half inch of the light color sediments. Uh, and you don't want to shake. Do not shake because you'll mess up everything. So if you look from the side, I don't know. Hmm, I don't know if this will show. Oh, that's it. So if you look from the side, you'll see I have the dark, then I have the light on the top. So that's the one and the two. Then what happened if I have some rocks that fell on the top. So I'm going to drop some small candies, or you can drop some raisins or things like that. So this is like, a, if that was on Earth, I would say, oh, maybe they're fossils, but we don't have fossils there. Then more sediment goes on the top and bury it. And then I have some dark sediment that come on the top. Then we have a change. We have more of the light one. So imagine if you wanted the light one could be water sediment. Well, the dark one could be more wind sediments or they could be different depth also. I put a little bit more of this guy. I'm actually going to finish the dark one. Then I put the light one, finish it. And from this side, when you look at it, I'm going to, because I need to turn it, I'm going to put the plastic, I'm going to push it down. Compact it actually when it become rocks, they get compacted that expel the water. And then we have cementation. And then from there it transforms into rock. That's called diagenesis. And you can see how I have different layers. Now I'm gonna say which rock is the oldest. Which rock is the oldest? What do you think? Which layer is the oldest? The top one, the bottom one. Which one lay down first will be the oldest. So the bottom one. And as you go up, you go towards younger and younger and younger ones. So that in stratigraphy is called the superposition principle of stratigraphy. So we talked earlier about the cross cutting where if I cut it, well, in that case, the cutting is younger than the material that is cut. Well, for the superposition, what is at the bottom is older than what is at the top. So when we actually look at the crater, we see some lower formation. Then there's the delta that is depositing sediment on top of the lower uh, formation, that there's other sediment that got deposited on top of the delta. So these show us that there were different geological events that went through time. They show different time frame. Um, depending on where you are, it could take a few thousand years to create that thickness that you have. 
or it can take millions of years. They're expecting that that size of a core sample on Mars could even represent billions of years. So what Mars Perseverance has, it has a special drill and that drill is gonna go and take samples. It's gonna extract the sample and it's gonna put it in the special container that is gonna be dropped on the ground and will be collected later by another mission. So did you all do your, your jar? You get to draw your jar and then you get to say layer one, layer two, then you have your candies, layer three, layer four, layer five, layer six. And you have to support that the bottom is um, very, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the bottom is the oldest and the top is the youngest. Once COVID-19 is over, We'll get together and we'll have crepes at uh, Camp Boucher, uh, Camp Boucher. So uh, call out treat, make sure to be there. So that's actually one of the things that is very important. Then after, if you, so make sure to draw that in your little notebook. Another thing that you can do, if you go back to this one, and then you had some water. Voilà. If I have a little thread of water that is going to go, this is actually a little bit messy. I need my measuring cup. Then you can have like a little incline. Then you pour it slowly, very, very slowly. You can see how the water is going and how it's following a rivulet, it's eroding on the way, it's making a river. And all the sediment is accumulating at the bottom. That's my delta. This is what's happening. So if I turn it around, that is the, the river that goes, and that's the lake of Jezero Crater. So why don't you draw that on your work? I give you five minutes to draw your jar. Then you can do that experiment. Just bend it and pour the water very slowly. Go ahead. Then we go into the candies. And by the way, I'm hungry too. <laughs> Just the smell of the cookies, you're like. <sighs> you know, you can use some butter after, you crush it together and you can make a crust for a pie. You just put some, um, you could put some pudding and you put some fresh fruit over and that's it, you have a fruit pie. Hey. <laughs> so you have the jar. And, uh, and that. I don't, if I put it down, I'm concerned that it's gonna. Here we go. And if you hear the noise, I'm opening my candies, my chocolate candy bars.
Thank you, Major Crozier. Take care. Thank you for coming. Okay, you ready for the candies? You've drawn your layers. You've created your river and your delta. I'll give you a couple more minutes. Pie, totally pie. Okay. We're getting candy bars yeah, right away. You can open your candy bars, get them ready. I'm just giving like another minute to people to finish the drawing of that activities and their labeling. Cause you have to write, this is the river, this is the Delta here. So, and here are the different layers and give the older, younger one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm gonna start cleaning my mess so that I can um get into the next job for that you're going to use your cutting board and your butter knife i don't think you need more than that i have different candies i have 100 grams, I have Twix, I have sne Squish Sneaker, Butterfinger, Crunch, and a York Mint. I could not find any Mars. They don't do Mars anymore. What's happening? What's wrong with that? Did any of you find some Mars bars? No, yeah, same here. I looked everywhere, just couldn't find Mars. I'm so disappointed. That was perfect. I wanted to have a Mars, but we were supposed to have a Mars bar. I could not get it. Okay, so what we're gonna do um, for this one, so you have to see what the geologists do. They take a sample. When we do a core sample, normally what we will do, we will drill through. So we'll use a special drill that will core and cut a circle, like a tube inside. Um, the problem with doing that with us is that um, one, the straws are not always strong enough to cut through the chocolate. And two, uh, in a lot of places, it's difficult to find clear straws or to find even plastic straws also. So I decided that we're just gonna simplify. You know that the equipment, and I can, I have a video if you want, that show the drilling, you drill a hole in it. And that's what the geologists will be studying. But the other way that we do that, we take a rock and we, uh, we cut the rock in two, we actually take big chunk of rock and we just saw through them. But before when we collect them, we check where's the bottom, where is the top. We check exactly where we found it on, on the map. So for me, that'd be Fred Meyer to Candy Isle. So <laughs> there's different layers because they were different shelf, but that's about it. Um, the, but the thing is, I need to know, like for example, this stuff for this crunch bar, 
this is the top, this is the bottom. So when I, I cut it and when I'm going to draw it, I need to take that into account. What is the top, what is the bottom? I should not be observing them upside down because remember from what we did earlier with the jar, the bottom is older than the top. So I have to keep them in the right orientation. So I'm going to push away these things. And what you're going to do, you're going to take your candies and you're going to carefully so you hold it you put your fingers away from the cutting part of the knife so i'm gonna be holding it like that and i'm gonna push through carefully and i'm gonna cut all our, all mine this way first then we'll do the observation so why don't you go and cut you can this oh this one's hard oh my goodness it's a crumbling one <laughs> voilà. the caramel makes it hard also the twix so right now i'm cutting i'm not even looking at them yet okay officially you should wipe your knife in between each because you don't want to contaminate because we we can actually do chemical composition there's no Mars bar. Did you find Mars bars in, in uh, Ifrada? We didn't find any. I look for them. <laughs> so, okay, then from there, what do we see is we, we look at it. And what do I have? I have a thin chocolate layer. I have a um, squishy caramel layer that have some inclusions of peanuts. Then I have another chocolate layer that have inclusion of rice grains. So I'm going to draw that. I'm going to measure and I'm going to write the measurement and I'm going to describe it. So that's what the geologist will do. But we don't do that with candies. Usually we do that with real things. So for example, in that case, what I will do it's too small, so I'm gonna do a scale of two. I'm gonna so once of um, one point two point six, I'm gonna do five point two. So I'm measuring five point two, and then the height and so one point six. I'm gonna do three point two. So that'll be that high. So then I'm gonna draw. And let me put bring some light in here. Earlier we had too much light, now we don't have enough. Here we go. So, and I'm gonna draw my chocolate bar. It's okay if you're struggling with um, drawing. We're not um, we're not doing art. So I will actually go and I measure, it's like two millimeters. So I have about that layer. Then how thick is my caramel? Uh, it's about that eight, so that'd be 1.6, about that one. So I have that inside. Then I have some chocolate, then I have the, the rice grains. And you can pull out your color pencils. And this is where you can continue and do that as long as you want. So this is a darker chocolate at first. So I'm going to have it in darker. So that's my first layer. Then it got covered by the other layers. So this is a type of activity that you can do, and it does take a while. And so I would recommend that you choose one candy bar. You start with one. Then after that, you can do as many as you want. But do one to the proper proportion where you're going to measure and respect this, this scale. Voila. Then I need my lighter one for my caramel. If you're not hungry, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and I have a little peanut inside here. And then I have to label it. 
so I have one with a dark chocolate base. Then I have two caramel plus peanut inclusions. I'm gonna kind of scoot that so you can see what I'm writing also. This one didn't work well. Inclusions there. I have three um, milk chocolate um, cover with how you got crispy rice. And scale is one to two. That's, so that's my scale. And that was my 100 grand one. Then I'll do the same, for example, ooh, this is a cool one. I can do the York. So for York, I measure same thing. This is four, so that'll be an eight. And that's a one, so it'll be a two. It says work mint. So there's the thin layer of dark chocolate. There's some on the side and some on the top. And then the white. It's also a one to two scale. And I do so officially when you do a core, you will not see the side. This size will not be visible. So you will see here that there's three layers. There's one dark chocolate layer. Uh, here the mint cream then dark chocolate layer. And so from that, that would be one, two, three. This is the youngest and that, then that. So for us, um, that will be also um, a way to see, for example, the dark chocolate happen when it's very dry. And uh, so we have very concentrated and very thin. We don't have a lot of weather. And maybe like uh, this mint layer could represent a season where it's very wet. There's lots of sediments that come in. And then there's another dry season. So there's a lot of information that are um, that can be extracted from that. We can see if a sea level is rising or if a sea level is lowering. We can see uh, which one is older, which one is younger. We can see um, if uh, there's, um, for example, like the peanut could be a fossil. So there's a lot of information that we extract from doing that. So a geologist will go around and actually we love, for example, rod cuts we go and we observe, we look at the rod cuts and we'll see the layers, they're already all done for us. We just have to draw them. Then we label them, we observe them. We take our um, little magnific magnifying lenses. You're gonna go and, and observe and see um, if there's anything special in it. So that's what a geologist would do. And that's what we're gonna do with Mars. The thing is right now, Perseverance is collecting the samples. And then from there, it's dropping them on the ground. They sealed, they're protected. And then we're hoping that in a few years, we're gonna have to wait a little bit, um, in collaboration with the ESA, the European Space Agency and Roscosmos, which are the Russians, we're hoping to send um, another rover that will be collecting the sample and that will launch them. So that's what I'm gonna show you just quickly that picture and we'll be done from that. You um, can continue to draw as many candies as you want and eat as many candies as you want. Um, I'm just gonna share quickly the part. So that's what we're hoping to do here. Uh, we're gonna have 
So this is what's happening right now. We're collecting, it's put on the ground, another rover will come. And then from there, they're going to launch it into our into space for it to be collected by another um, an, another um, vehicle spaceship. So if you look over there in, in the next slide, come on. No, not that. Sorry. In the next slide, this is we did the Mars 20 vision mission, we need to send a, a sample retrieval lander that will collect them and that will send it back out the, from Mars, put it in orbit, for example. From there, there's another orbiter that is going to be sent to collect what was sent into orbit and bring it back down to Earth for us to be able to get our collectors and uh, get our samples our canisters and be able to study them and really see uh, up in hand, first hands, what do we have? So this is, um, there's a lot to go, but thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate, enjoy the candies and the cookies. If you have any question, please feel free to, to ask. Um, but like, you know, you are part of that. You are welcome to, um, study more about that and share all that you know, all that you discover, and hopefully some of you will be part of some of this mission to help us going to Mars. Thank you very, very much, and please um, let us know, email me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you again for everyone who is participating in today's class. We have a short poll if you'd be able to answer that. And we will uh, stop the recording here momentarily.